Law Day Live presented by the Chicago Bar Association. I'm Sadie Oliva, Chief Administrative Law Judge for the Department of Children and Family Services and also a member of the Chicago Bar Association. I will be your host for today's edition of You and the Law, where our guest attorney is Carol Billy Oshana of Oshana Law. Carol has been an attorney for over 15 years, and she concentrates her practice in a variety of areas, including employment law, general civil litigation, and real estate. Today she'll be talking to you about landlord-tenant rights. So please listen carefully if you're a tenant or landlord in the city of Chicago because what you're going to learn today is going to be shocking. You may not even know the mistakes you're making as a landlord and those mistakes could cost you a lot of money. A big welcome to Carol. Let me ask you a couple questions about your career. Sure. Where and when did you graduate from law school? I graduated from the Chicago, um, over here at DePaul University College of Law in 1997. And you've practiced in many areas, but your main um, area of practice is a real estate, is that correct? It's one of the big ones, yeah. And you've lectured industry professionals, correct? Yes, mostly real estate agents, brokers. And I know that you started your own firm in approximately 2005? Mm -hmm. And that's Oshana Law? Yes, that's about right. And I also uh, have learned that you've covered uh, some high-profile cases. Do you want to tell us about those? Well, I had a fun case against um, a plastic surgeon. Actually, the plastic surgeon was suing one of my clients for writing a Yelp review. And so that broadcast, the story on that was on Fox TV. And then it went international, and I was on the cover of India Times. That was fun. That sounds really fun. Uh, also, you've won a full reversal before the Seventh Circuit, which is a pretty big deal. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that full reversal? It was a discrimination case. Um, the lower court uh, basically threw out my case on a motion for summary judgment, and I appealed it before the Seventh Circuit, and I was extremely nervous. I was shaking, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm in front of the most important people in the world right now, so much smarter than I'll ever be. But... But Fortune. You won. I won. They were on my side. I was really happy. That's great. So, what is it that interested you and what made you become well versed in landlord tenant rights? Well, I grew up uh, in Chicago and my mom owned property. So, we had a lot of problems with tenants. Um, incredible. In fact, we had one tenant who we were trying to evict and he made me feel very helpless because at the time I wasn't a lawyer, I was in college and he had threatened to rape me and he had my mom arrested and my brother arrested for battery which obviously never happened the guy was a big guy and then he tried to have me arrested for battery it was just a nightmare that sounds terrible so it's because of your experiences when you were younger that you became a lawyer and then uh, became interested in this area so that you could help others that may have been in uh, the same situation that's correct all right so what is the RLTO and what does that stand for it stands for the Residential Landlord Tenant Ordinance, and it applies to buildings in the city of Chicago that are not owner occupied and contain uh, more than six units. So, if you live in the building and it has six or fewer units, most of the ordinance doesn't apply. But if you have, if you don't live in the building at all, which a lot of landlords don't, it does apply even for a single family home or a condominium. All right, and is the RLTO pro-landlord or is it pro-tenant? In my opinion, it's very pro-tenant. And what's the number one area that you see problems for landlords? The number one area of problems is security deposits. Uh, landlords don't know what to do with them. They commingle them with their other assets or their other monies in the bank, or they don't give an interest rate notification. They don't give the interest. And so that's when we sue. So would you say that most leases in Chicago are compliant under the RLTO? The opposite. I would say, in my experience, 99% of them are not compliant. 99%. And uh, why is that? People don't know the law. It's really complicated and tiresome and exact. If you don't do exactly what the RLTO requires, and I bring a lawsuit against the landlord, for example, or somebody else does, it's strict liability. So what are the some of the things that uh, most landlords don't know or should be aware of? Uh, like you said, let's talk about uh, security deposits or any kind of notice that the RLTO requires them to give a tenant when the tenant signs the lease. Can you tell us a little bit about both of those? 
Some of the requirements are rational. Uh, for example, you have to give a receipt that's signed by the landlord indicating the amount that was accepted and the address of the property, and it has to be signed by the person receiving it. That makes sense. And if you don't, you have to give the deposit back. You have to give the receipt the same day. Some of the rules are absurd. For example, you have to give an interest rate notification to the tenant for that current year when the tenant moves in, but also the two years prior when the tenant was never a tenant. It doesn't make sense, but it's a requirement. And what happens if you don't? I can sue you and get two times the security deposit plus attorney fees plus costs. And interest as well? Yes, the interest is usually minimal, but yes, I can get that. All right, and what if the tenant moves out, the lease is over, and suddenly the tenant becomes well-informed and well-versed in this area of law, can they then go back and sue the landlord for whatever the landlord may not have been in compliance with during the term of the lease, or is there a statute there's, of limitations? There's a two-year statute of limitations from the time that the infraction occurred. So, for example, if a tenant leaves and you don't give them their interest on their security deposit within 30 days of leaving, then the clock starts running and I, the tenant can sue for two years after that, within two years. Okay. And what uh, recourse, let's switch it around a little bit and talk about what recourse does a landlord have against a tenant who may cause destruction of the property and what's actually considered enough destruction where you can deduct that from the security deposit, what can't be deducted from the security deposit? This is an area of law that's really difficult. You can deduct from the security deposit things that are not normal wear and tear. So, for example, you cannot deduct from a tenant failure to um, change a light bulb, for example, if the light bulb went out, or you know, a hole in the wall that was caused by a little nail that's you know, a picture, not a hole in the wall that's caused by something dramatic. You know. Uh, little little scratches on the floor, things like that, S you know, smudges, dirt, not excessive dirt, normal dirt, which, you know, these are subjective. So it's very difficult to know exactly what you can deduct from, but it has to be something reasonable. Now, if they do something unreasonable, for example, I had one client that had spray paint. The tenant spray painted the entire apartment on the cabinets, on everything, just... It was very bizarre. That's not normal wear and tear, and he could deduct from that. All right, and what about um, evictions? Can you tell us about evictions? What should landlords know? Is there a notice requirement? Uh, can they just force the tenant to leave right away as soon as there's non-payment of, of rent? Tell us a little bit about evictions. When a tenant doesn't pay rent, the landlord has to provide a five-day notice to the tenant, and they have to deliver it. They have to serve it. So it's not enough to you know, post it on a wall or post it on a door. If the tenant is living there, you have to give it to someone in the apartment that's 13 or older. And if the tenant doesn't pay the rent within five days, the landlord may bring an action in court for eviction. Now, if the tenant pays the landlord and the landlord accepts the rent even after five days, then their rights are extinguished in terms of eviction. So what I recommend to landlords is that they do it right away. The longer you wait, the longer those five days it takes, the longer it takes to evict. Once I file suit, I can usually get, if I can get the person served, I can usually go to court in about three weeks, and then in theory there is a trial right then and there, or there might be a one-time continuance, and then there'll be a trial the second time, the second time we are up, it's pretty fast. The slow part is the sheriff. You know, you submit it to the sheriff and it can it's their schedule. It could take months for the sheriff to get out there and actually remove the person. But in the meantime, you cannot release the property? It's very difficult. Somebody's living there, so you usually have a hostile tenant. They won't let you in. You try to go in. You give them notice. You have to give them 48-hour notice. Sometimes they change the locks. It becomes very contentious. And what about serving the correct party? What if you don't include uh, the correct parties in your lawsuit? Does that affect the timeline? Absolutely. Uh, I have had a lot of people in court. I, I sit and watch, and I've seen landlords, especially you know working-class landlords, that are crying, literally crying, because 
they don't know what they did wrong, but on the on the complaint, it has to say the name of the person that's on the lease and all unknown occupants. It has to use those words and all unknown occupants because if somebody else is living there and the land, uh, the sheriff goes out there and that person then is, is there and all these other people that are not listed on the order of eviction, they will not remove. And that's even true if they're not even on the lease. Correct. <clears throat> okay. Now, I have a quick question about um, the damage to property that I forgot to ask you. To avoid any problems when the lease is uh, expired and maybe there may be some damage that you would like to deduct as a landlord, what's the best thing to do to document that damage? Maybe before and after pictures? What do you recommend? I recommend to landlords that prior to the tenant going in, that they take pictures and videos of the condition of the property, maybe with also a newspaper or some way to indicate the date. And then they have the tenant sign that they acknowledge that the premises are in good condition and that these pictures are an accurate representation, for example. Because what happens is afterwards, the tenant says, no, that was like that the whole time. I didn't cause that. So now you have proof. Of course, this helps the tenant too because Sometimes it was there before, and the landlord says, you did it, but in fact, that condition was there prior to the tenant coming in. So it protects the landlord and the tenant. I always recommend doing that. That's a great recommendation. So don't forget, take pictures if you're a landlord of the property before you lease it and right after, and make sure you get the date documented on that video or photograph. Now, what happens if the property that's being leased and rented is facing foreclosure? Are there all sorts of rules regarding that situation? You're supposed to notify the tenant in writing. Uh, if you are in foreclosure, I never see landlords do that. And frankly, the penalty is low. I think it's $200 if you don't do it. Um, usually the landlords are pretty broke. So you'd be suing somebody and not getting a judgment anyways. But in theory, that's what they're supposed to do. There's worse rules, worse I say, for the person purchasing the property. When they buy the property at a sheriff's sale or if the bank acquires it, then the rules are absolutely crazy. It's the Protecting Tenants and Foreclosure Act. And, um, and then in Chicago, there's a rule that requires you to provide them with written notice in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Polish, never mind that they may not speak English, uh, Spanish or Polish or Chinese, you still have to provide it in those languages and post it to, uh, before you can even collect rent. And then you can't raise the rent for more, by more than 102% forever. So every year it's 102% increase, assuming that this is a bona fide tenant, a real tenant, not the old owner. And if you want them to leave, and for, let's just say you want to fix the place up and you want that tenant to leave, you have to pay them a relocation assistance fee of $10,600 per apartment. It's absolutely crazy. And that may exceed the value of the property in some cases. Yeah, if you want to buy on the south side, let's say, you know, a lot of those properties, you can get them at a foreclosure sale for forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, and then perhaps it's not in great condition and you want to fix it, and that costs easily forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for each unit. Uh, and then you have to pay on top of that, let's say it's a three unit and it, over $30,000 to get people out of the building. That just, that just doesn't, that's not workable as an investment in many instances. All right, so tenants definitely have a lot of rights in Chicago based on what you've been saying. Um, and landlords have a lot of obligations. So would you describe it as a potential minefield for a landlord to not know exactly what's in the RLTO and not abide by those rules? In my practice, I talk to landlords all the time. I talk to tenants all the time. And I always tell landlords, take a seminar with someone. It doesn't have to be me. I don't care. Somebody who does landlord-tenant law, sit with an attorney for an hour, an hour and a half, and learn. It's not that expensive. A lot of lawyers only charge $200, $300 an hour. It's not that much money. And if you don't become educated on it, then you will suffer the consequences someday. The penalties can easily go up to $10,000. I've had situations where I've sued landlords and they walk into court incredulous that they have to pay thousands of dollars 
because they didn't pay their tenant 17 cents in interest or they had to pay thousands of dollars in attorney fees because they didn't give the bed bug pamphlet. I've actually won a case on that one and I got my attorney fees for that. The, the rules are strict and they are awful for a landlord and they're very difficult to follow. I always tell landlords, if you can, don't take a security deposit. If the tenant is a good credit tenant, you know, pretty seemingly responsible, and they do cause damage to the unit, you can always sue them after the fact. And that's okay to not take a security deposit. There's no requirement that any landlord uh, take a security deposit. No, in fact, what they're doing now is taking move-in fees that are non-refundable. So I've had clients require whatever, $300, $350 move-in fee that might cover some of the damage. It'll definitely cover cleaning, things like that, but it won't cover gouges in the floor but at least it's something. And then I've also had tenants, uh, excuse me, landlords that accept the last month's rent, thinking that that protects them, but it doesn't because you have to pay interest on that last month's rent also. And a lot of times they don't know that. So then I can go after them for that as well. Now, what if a tenant leaves and moves out without notifying the landlord or even if he does, he or she does notify the landlord, what happens if the tenant just breaks the lease? What recourse does the landlord have? Well, it depends. If the landlord provided a summary of the RLTO, then they're protected. If they did not, which a, landlord's, which a lot of landlords don't, they just give a lease and don't realize that there's a summary of the residential landlord tenant ordinance that they have to provide to the tenant. If they don't provide that, the, the tenant can leave anytime. They can terminate the lease anytime. Now, if the tenant leaves, a landlord has to try to relet the property, and they have to make a reasonable effort to do that. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have to hire a real estate agent, but it's that's one thing you can do, but you can also put on Craigslist, and you should keep a record of that. Uh, put it in the reader, whatever it takes to try to reasonably relet the premises. And then if you can relet it and you make an effort, Great. If you relet it for exactly the same amount and they get in, then you have no damages. But if, let's say, it takes a couple of months to relet it, that tenant will be responsible for those months that were not paid. But generally speaking, in my experience, tenants who up and leave are leaving because they don't have any money. So suing them is kind of a waste. It's going to end up costing the landlord more to go after them. Okay. Now, are there any rules that are important for tenants to know about if they have, let's say, a shady landlord who doesn't keep uh, the heating system working or broken pipes or anything that makes the place inhabitable? Uh, sh I love the phrase shady landlords. Um, I've had a lot of shady landlords <laughs> in my life, and I was never one of them, just so you know. Uh, but the the tenant has a lot of rights in that in that uh, circumstance. For example, with heat, it's an essential service, so the landlord has to fix it within 24 hours. The tenant can leave and get uh, alternative housing, and they can have the landlord pay for that as long as it doesn't exceed the one month's rent. If the landlord doesn't fix it uh, within 72 hours, then the tenant can terminate the, the uh, lease. Now, if it's something that's not essential, then it has to be, you have to provide them with a written notice 14 days, they have to fix it, and there's some remedies about you being able to fix it yourself and deducting it from the rent. Okay, now what about something that we've heard a lot about in the news lately, and it's a very unpleasant topic, but what happens if a tenant brings in a bed bug infestation? It wasn't there before the tenant moved in, and then suddenly you have a bed bug problem. Whose fault is that? Who's responsible to pay for the removal of the bed bugs, what happens? This is a nightmare scenario for both a tenant, a landlord, and the tenants around that tenant. Um, the landlord has to take care of it right away. 10 days, they have to have somebody go in and take care of it. The tenant has to notify the landlord within five days. Now, there's no, you can't retaliate against a tenant for bringing in bed bugs. You can't force them to be evicted so the landlord is stuck with the cost of doing it. Now, it's unclear uh, the 
the rules don't say that a landlord can't sue the tenant for damages, I would imagine that, for example, a tenant that brings it over and over again, you could probably go after, sue them for damages, but the tenant is also required, if the, if the exterminator says you gotta throw away that couch, you gotta throw away that bed, the tenant has to do it. And if they don't, then the landlord can bring action against the tenant. We have an internet question. Yeah, um, the question is, uh, is the landlord required to tell a new tenant of prior flooding problems to the apartment? Uh, no, it has to, they have to tell them about the last year's code violations. And those are actually online, so any tenant can find out. But as long as it's remedied, if it wasn't a code violation, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and if any of the viewers today have any more questions regarding rat, uh, landlord tenant, tenant rights, they can call you at what number? 312-404-8390, or they can email me at Oshana Law, O-S-H-A, and as in Nancy A, Oshana Law at yahoo.com. And let me see if there are any other uh, questions from the audience. Yeah, we have one more. Um, what is uh, what does the landlord show? Um, what if the landlord shows the unit without notice? The landlord has to provide 48 hours notice to a tenant before showing it. I do have a situation that's happening right now, and um, it is a very, very bad idea to just walk in on a tenant. A landlord can be sued for that. All right, well, it seems like we may be running out of time, so I want to give a big thank you to our guest, Carol Billy Oshana, for her very informative interview regarding landlord-tenant rights. Uh, Again, I'm Sazi Oliva, and I'd like to thank the viewers for tuning into Law Day Live, presented by the Chicago Bar Association. Uh, please tune in tomorrow for our very last Law Day Live presentation covering important criminal law topics uh, with guest attorney Barry Lewis and hosted by Eleanor O. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.